<laughs> Should be me? Yeah. Hello, everybody. This is quite strange having to sort of panoramic view of the room, however. Um, is that, I'm going to stop coming now, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming along today. Today started as a conversation on a, on a Teams call where I was having a little bit of a, a rant. <laughs> And then you get asked, oh, come on, be a keynote speaker and say all about anything. So sure. <laughs> so I'll keep, I'll keep to as much of that content. Am I echoing? I feel like I've got an echo. I think, I think it might just be a little bit too close to Stephen's microphone. It's going to be mine. So I would. Okay, that's better. Great, thank you. So I originally wished I could have studied psychology or psychiatry or something like that, something about how we think. And maybe that's why on that rant, what I came around to about looking about the national planning framework was about behaviour change, exactly what Stephen's been referring to, and about not just the behaviour change that's required from our populations, but our own behaviour change as well. We've got a lot of detailed context that that's Stephen's run through for you already, um, and that will go into certain areas. But I just want to give a bit of an, an overview of three key things that I'd like us to keep in mind. I'd like to say today, but I'd actually like to say we've got a national plan dream for 10 years, so a wee bit longer maybe than today, hopefully. Um, but to start that and to bring that to life, um, I just want to do a little exercise. If everybody is okay to close their eyes, if you're not, that's fine, just look down if you're not happy doing that. And I just want you to picture, Alan, I can see you, you're not closing your eyes. <laughs> With your eyes closed, you can picture everything in the room that is blue. Okay. And then just open your eyes and have a look around for what is actually blue. Now, I'm hoping at that point you go, oh, there's a lot more blue than I thought there was. And I'm starting to notice it more. And what I'm hoping from today is my introduction is a few things to keep in mind to bring forward into the blue as we move forward. And as we move forward to implementing um, the national planning framework as well and what it will take overall as a sort of high level way of thinking in order to do that. So first of all, for myself, do I have a copy of you? Yeah, I do, great. Um, I'm going to cover three aspects across that. Behaviour change, as Stephen said, is, is going to be crucial. Um, part of that behaviour change is what we're looking to do for our communities to change their behaviour. Um, and I'll have a little look at, at what we need to do in order to achieve that. But then we need to get on to our own behaviour change as well, both as planners and as other professions as well. So that will be the three key areas that I'm, I'm going to, to look at. That quote is taken from Making Healthy Places um, back in 2012. Obesity, inactivity, depression, and loss of community has not happened to us, but we have planned, legislated, and subsidised it. And I was slot into that now. Climate change, child poverty, inequalities, health inequalities, 24 years difference in health inequality, depending on where you live in Scotland, and the worst record in the whole of Europe. We haven't done any of these things intentionally. We have all been working away with the very best of intentions, but without thinking about our unintended consequences on our populations of those decisions that we are legislating for and planning. The change I see in the new national planning framework is the fact that up until now, it has always had Stephen was referring to outcomes, it has always had an outcome about delivering some form of growth. Um, and as a planner, when I got into my career, I found that very discouraging because that certainly wasn't why I studied planning, was to, to be there to deliver growth. But what we have now is a framework that looks 
that asks us in the act, and I actually just thought this is a really boring plan of slate was taken from the act of it. <laughs> but to want to prove it, the act asks that the national planning framework delivers another set of six new outcomes. And I think that is fantastic that we get that support from the act to be looking at not just housing needs, but that we focus in on particular parts of our population, that we look at health and well-being, we look at rural depopulation, we look at equality and eliminating discrimination, we look at climate change, and we look at biodiversity. Now, I think a lot of the talk of what we hear about the, the National Planning Framework now is focusing in on that climate change aspect. And I think it's absolutely crucial that we be thinking about all of them because, as Stephen said, we do not have the luxury of time to be trying to take these and pick them off one at a time. We need to be looking at the health and well-being of our people, of our planet, and to be playing our part in reducing inequalities, both health inequalities but social and economic ones as well. And I do think that we have that context now within the National Planning Framework. But the behaviour change that we're talking about, the change that we need from our own communities, has to be from the minute they are stepping out their door. Not asking them to change, not telling people what they need to start doing, but to be creating places that enable them to do it without even thinking that they've made a different choice in life. Now that will take time. We have so much of our environment that's already built. But as we deal with any change that happens in an area, that's role planning, then we are able to have that in our minds. How does this impact the person stepping out their front door and the choice that they make without them even realising it? It's absolutely crucial. And when we're thinking and when we're putting that limited time and resource that Stephen was referring to into how we move forward and the decisions that we make, we need to be thinking, is this a decision that delivers on climate, on well-being of people and inequality? or is it only actually delivering on one of them? An example would be looking at um, electric cars. Absolutely, while they're the future, they'll reduce our carbon emissions, we'll be sorted. <laughs> Thanks. But if, all, if that's all that we're focusing in on, then we're only delivering on one part of the issues that we face right now. If instead we focus our time, our limited time, our limited attention into how we move around and how we do that by walking, by access to public transport, um, by um, cycling, and we think about the places that we're creating, we're thinking about the densities that we're creating that enable people to be supported to walk to a local shop, that enable Bus, buses to actually want to serve an area because there's a sufficient population to make it viable, then if we start to think about those decisions, you're delivering the triple win that, that Stephen was referring to. Every time we're making a decision, if we're only achieving one of them, then I think we need to do better and we need to think with a bit more clarity on how we deliver all of those things. A third of our population in Scotland doesn't have access to a car. Half of our population in our deprived areas don't have access to a car. That's households. Children don't have access to a car anyway. Um, so if we're moving forward thinking that electric cars, for instance, are going to, to be a solution for us, we're actually just exacerbating the inequality that we've got in our country because they cost so much that they're, they're beyond the reach of those who already can't afford a car. They're certainly not going to be able to afford that. So if we're thinking about that triple win, that's where we need to be going. Every decision that we make, running it through all of those areas. And I'll come into a bit more detail on that in a moment. Stephen talked about outcomes. And I think this was where I had a little bit of the rant on the team's call. We have a set of outcomes for Scotland. They're called Scotland's Place and Wellbeing Outcomes. It's a range of national organisations that got together about four years ago and prepared them. If you Google it, you'll see them full um, briefing paper on the background to them. I'm pretty tired of hearing about healthy towns and climate towns, and we need to just pull together and deliver on these outcomes. They've been sourced, they've been evidenced, they've been researched, 
And let's stop debating cross sectors as to what is a good place when we already have it fully identified for us. Outcomes that don't just deliver on one of those aspects, but that deliver on climate, deliver on people, and deliver on inequalities as well. So my ask would be that we look at embedding those outcomes into our decisions, into our thinking, into our policies, our proposals and our actions as we move forward. And that we get on with the job because we've already got them instead of debating. They're consistent, they're comprehensive, and they mean that we're all working towards the same aim. So with that then, I suppose what I'm concluding is that to move forward, and to think about that triple win, we do get that support from the National Planning Framework. These outcomes sit at all levels. So when Duncan McLennan is talking about regionally, they work up there. If you look at them locally in a neighbourhood, you're delivering a 15-minute li local living neighbourhood as well. So they apply across the scale. But what about planning? Stephen talked about, you know, the planners in the room and what is the ask about that. Um, and for myself, I come back to our, our purpose. What is your purpose? A deep one on a Monday morning. But that's, that's where I come back to. What is our purpose? It was set out for us in the act. And I think we just kind of rattle through it now and go, yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. But I think it's important to draw out that long-term public interest. How do we decide what that long-term public interest is? It's that tri triple win, it's achieving that that delivers our long-term public interest because we have so many communities, not one community that, that is represented. So we need to be thinking about what it is that that long-term public interest is, that it's everybody, that we're thinking about that triple win. But if we look as planners on how to take part in that, then that includes all planners. That includes every planner in every sector to be thinking about that as their purpose. That wasn't set for public sector, that's set for everybody to be thinking about that. And what do they bring to the table to nudge that forward? We're all doing our jobs anyway. Whatever sector we're in, if we can keep that thought about the triple win, if we keep that thought about the health of our own planet and people in our minds as we're doing that job, I would have thought that's a basic part of being human and wanting to do that for your for the place that we live. Um, so to keep that long-term public interest, to be all be thinking about the entirety of the planning process. From the moment that we decide with our slight arrogance that we know what people need in a place, right through to writing our policies, to firming up a proposal, to submitting an application, to assessing that application, to having reporters arbitrate on, on decisions, to conditions being applied. It has to flow the whole way through the whole process to be delivering on this. And a crucial part of it having to be all of that and our behaviour change around linking all of that up is that we can't be um, picking and choosing a bit of the framework that suits us. We're awfully good as planners. We'll pull out one little paragraph that fits us just nicely and ignore the rest of the document. I don't believe that's what the framework has been written for us to do. It's for us to take everything in its entirety and its ambition and to be delivering upon that. And I know that a definite part of my rant um, to, to Stephen and Gareth was around the fact that that week I had been speaking to a reporter who shall go unnamed, who said, you know, I'm just, but you just pull out bits that refer to the case that you're doing. You don't need to read the whole thing in its entirety. And I know it's a long document, but we can't be doing that. We've spent years discussing housing need and housing land and, not, you know, forecasting populations. Well, that's not the ask now. The ask now is that long-term public interest. And that isn't just population forecasts and housing need. That's thinking about what's happening in our area. Who is experiencing what in the area? Who is experiencing, what groups are experiencing inequalities? And what are we doing when we're writing our plans and our policies and making our decisions to help those particular parts of the population? And as I say, if we carry on where in some areas where I'm in working, we have a, um, a climate strategy that's looking quite rightly to include the, the reduction in car kilometres by 20% by 2030, but you still have a local development plan that's allowing car-reliant, low-density housing. 
you're not matching up even within the one organisation of council. We need to be linking across and supporting each other on what we're doing. So, that's planning. That's great. That, that would be my ask of you with planning. But there's a whole other element, as, as Stephen referred to, which is that planning cannot deliver the national planning framework on its own. It really does need to go beyond that. And that's because of the places that we create. There we go. Any kind of place-based collaboration, anything that we say is a place-based approach. And I hear a lot of folks saying, well, we're taking a place-based approach in this plan. And it seems to say it in the introduction, and then I don't see much in the plan that actually is taking that place-based approach and is thinking about everybody's contribution into that place. If we look at any place, we've got the physical the streets, the buildings, the fields, whatever. But we've also always, these days, we've got digital, we're shopping, working, socialising online, so we've got the impact of that. And then we have that financial impact. Who's investing in it? Who's paying for that pavement? Who's working in that shop? There's all of that mixing around. And right in the middle, we have people. And that's absolutely crucial that we're thinking about that impact on people. And if we look at that, that isn't just planning that can influence that place. It's far broader the impacts that we can have but we can have an impact on how people are living and how they're stepping out that front door. This is just one small example of that kind of impact where along the top, we have um, somebody going from their home, dropping their child off at school, walking along to the local shop, walking to a local neighbour, elderly neighbour, dropping something in, checking in on them, and, and getting the bus to work. And then they can do the same route back home again at the end of the day. When we make a decision for the best of intentions, back to that original quote, for the best of in intentions to put that school um, in a more greenfield position where it can quickly be updated, be a much more sustainable building, provide an awful lot more resources and amenities for those attending the school, even be a community school now. But when we do that with the best of intentions, we are having unintended consequences that we need to be thinking about. Because immediately we're meaning something's got to give. You're dropping your child at school and you potentially just to get straight to work. You've potentially got in the car to do that anyway now because it's going so far. Um, so you may have had to go out and buy a second car or a first car, whatever. But the other thing that has to give is that aging in place you know if we're not there as a cohesive community supporting each other and um, then we're not able to help people to age in place or crucially if you ain't got any choice about dropping in because that's not an elderly neighbor it's an elderly relative and you need to be dropping in because you're a carer then that opportunity to also go to work and have say a part-time job it has to get dropped and immediately you're dealing with that inequalities poverty and the impact that that is having. Likewise, the simple thing of having to potentially buy the car to, to make that journey, there's evidence of so many households going into poverty, both parents working and going into poverty because they need to buy that second car. So those impacts need to be taken into account when we're making those decisions about, you know, new housing, the, the, the forum that we're on is housing and place. And that's why the place, but I wish it was place and housing, because you can have a good quality house, but you know, if it isn't in the right place, then it's, it's not delivering on any of these, of these triple wins at all. So that's just one example of the kinds of impacts that we're having. And that's just a list of the, the sort of, if we keep things local, we're enabling people to have less stress in their life, to build communities, to build the links standing around the, the school gates that enables them to actually be part of a community school, get a part-time job because they know somebody now that, that lives nearby. So if they have a problem picking up their child, they can give them a call. There's so much in there about that walkable community and delivering on that and density and the role of density in achieving a walkable area. Just want to close in reflecting a little bit then about the work that I'm doing at the moment with Public Health Scotland and the Improvement Service. 
We have for two years now been doing a, a program called the Shaping Places for Wellbeing program. So it does what it says on the tin. It is looking at the decisions that we're making. We then working locally in certain parts of Scotland with the council and the health board to look at the decisions that we're making and to have an input and a support to them to make sure that the impact in place, the unintended consequences of what we're doing are being considered. We have so many plans and strategies. We're all going to continue proposals and applications that we're going to continue preparing. And what we want to do is bring to the fore that as you're doing that anyway, think about the impact that it's having on place. So what we bring into that decision making is where we start with the what's happening, the evidence-led policy that, that we as planners are, are all about. It's bringing in different evidence, as I say, not just household forecasts and population projections, but actually looking at what are the inequalities in this area, who is suffering, what parts of the population are experiencing it, um, so that we start properly evidence-led um, decision making. When we look at what is it we want to see happening, as I say, we have the place and wellbeing outcomes that are there, established, and they tell us what it is that every place needs for those living and using that place to thrive. How could we help? What was the interventions that we could be taking if, if there are issues in an area? There's a vast amount of evidence and research um, that sits behind the place and wellbeing outcomes. The same evidence and research that shaped the questions in the place standard tool, um, kept up to date by Public Health Scotland, uh, and every theme in those place and wellbeing outcomes being covered right through from how we move around, the spaces that we move through, the housing that we live in, the access to fair work and so on, and, and right through into the more the areas around feeling you've got a sense of belonging, that you feel safe, um, and that you feel you have a sense of influence over that area as well, outside of your front door also. But then finally, another process that we're doing is we're looking at those plans and those strategies that we're all busy producing, and we're assessing them, and we're bringing in other perspectives with really short half-day sessions to say, I wish your local development plan moving forward going to deliver on, on the place and wellbeing outcomes. But it's not just planning. That's the important thing. We're also looking at economic strategies. I'll just pop up. There's a range of just what we have been looking at just up until March 2023. A full range of plans and documents that goes beyond planning. And if we don't get to that point of looking beyond our own local development plan, we can't be delivering on the ask of the national planning framework. We need to be in and having conversations around something as local as in Rubber Glen, the Burnhill neighbourhood plan prepared by the community, right up to on the, the bottom far left there, the NHS Fourth Valley healthcare strategy, right up at that regional level as well. And asking and looking at each plan as it's being reviewed and thinking, what's it contributing to place? And in a lot of cases at the moment, it's not. It doesn't even mention the importance of place, a healthcare strategy, a health and social care partnership strategy that doesn't mention the importance of place. So how does that support the local development plan then to make confident decisions with its own policy if we're not embedding that importance of place into health? Health talk about a thing called the social determinants of health. It's actually about the importance of the places that we live, work and play what we're all about. So we're, we've got the same ambition, but we're not always linking up and actually supporting each other with our policies. Thanks, Gary. So to close, finish with. An ounce of practice is worth more than tons of preaching. So I'm feeling preaching here. <laughs> And, uh, and the rest of today, I hope we get a bit of chance at some practice as well. As I said, we have the context, I think, to, to deliver. We need to keep thinking about behaviour change. There's two levels of behaviour change that we need to be thinking about. And my answer would be is that we go back into our different organisations and sectors and that we First and foremost, think about that purpose of planning. Think about the purpose that sits behind the national planning framework and the long-term public interest. 
we think about the cost of what we're doing to our communities, to ourselves, because we're part of a community, the cost of it to our planet, of what we're doing, planning and proposing, and the cost of it to those in our society who are struggling at the moment, who are really experiencing acute need, because as planners, we have an impact on that. And if you don't see that impact, please just Google Place and Wellbeing Outcomes, and you'll see a vast amount of information there that will, that will help you to, to see that. For that quote there, I would say an ounce of practice creates, but then I say half an ounce action is worth tons of preaching. So I hope that after today and, and all of the, the work that we'll go through this afternoon, that we're off and actually thinking about the small actions that we can take. As I say, we're doing this work anyway. We just need to include these blue thinking into it, keeping those three things in, in our minds as we move off into our own work and get back to work tomorrow and get on with the day job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, classic question. Um, I'll come over here. Um, we're going to have a break, but as I said, we need to have some contributions from the floor. So as quickly as we can, I've got one mic. I think Gareth can deal with over there. Can you, Gareth, with your microphone? Back row. Sorry, big problem. Thanks, Irene. That was really uh, inspiring. Uh, I'm a lecturer in planning at Glasgow, and I'm always bang on about um, planning's original purpose in the 1940s about you know trying to join up social, economic, and environmental issues. And of course, 19th century planning arose from crises in public health, and back to the cholera epidemic, and so on. How can we deliver on what you've said when local councils are have been decimated? But in terms of funding, in the last ten years, we need skills and capacities. How can we? Convince policymakers or you know make councils find money to, to do all this because that's the real issue that I would see. Thanks. Good question. Um at the moment in, in Scotland, obviously our councils have been, I mean, the budget cuts that they're going through are absolutely brutal, as you say, and the impact on resources and so on. A lot of these plans are going to happen anyway, though. We still have to be done someone will still get that duty to do it, so we can still be doing that. But I think there's also a role for local government moving forward, and there's a, a report called Delivering a New Future for Scottish Local Authorities that is a group of seven uh, chief execs from local government who pulled together to say, what do we do? We've got acute need, and we don't, we're not getting the funding that we need. And councils need to move into an arena where they become more of the facilitators of support and change, where they work far better with communities, looking at what's already happening in a community and building upon that, where they work and build more trusted relationships with central government as policy is coming out and actually testing and working things through like that, where we use data a lot more cleverly. And again, that's that's what we've been doing is looking far more beyond the, the proof level of data that we have to date, that we expand that out and we make better use of data. And we put more work into really understanding inequalities. So if we have identified that there are particular groups that are really experiencing inequality in our area, then we need to make sure we go and speak to them. It's not the seldom heard and will turn up on a Tuesday night. It's actually having that those skills and in-house and councils they tend to have the skills i'm not saying it's always planners that have got it but there are a lot of organizations and there's the third sector who are fully aware and working much more closely with communities and we need to embrace that and be working more with them and facilitating the change because i don't believe we can be stepping in and making that change happen in the way that we perhaps could with, with more funding so yeah i would recommend have a look at that document Thank you. Um, we've got plenty working. Um, really like having his presentation, especially reminder that planning is now officially about so much more than growth. We really need to promote the message strongly to decision makers. I suppose the question might be who are the decision makers? Um, because as I say, I think it's perhaps more than planning. 
Uh, and what is the question? What parts of the MPF4 will be most helpful in implementing health and well being objectives? What are your priorities for next steps following the, the MPF4 adoption? Well, I think that's possibly that's a very wide question, and um, it's kind of what we're here to discuss. Um, any responses? I mean, Moving forward with it, it's actually to deliver on those place and well-being outcomes. And at the moment, we're going through the national planning framework, pulling out what elements of it are feeding into those place and well-being outcomes. And it's pretty broad coverage as well. So, so that is that is why I don't by saying we have the policy support in order to move forward and actually get going. In the past, we didn't have that. We were still dealing with a national document that talked too much about growth rather than actually thinking about these bigger issues that we're facing. So I think there is that support. Um, and that question about we really need to promote that message strongly to decision makers, it's the decision makers that are producing all these those different plans and strategies. That's who we need to be promoting, the, the role of planning and the role of place and how important it is, and that they're having unintended consequences with the very best of intentions. And what we are finding when we run these sessions, that people at the end who've written their policy and strategy are just astounded at the different perspective that this, the process has, has brought into their thinking, that they realize now how they're impacting on the place um, and they can move forward. And, and, you know, an example of um, an economic strategy that we've reviewed where it was still very much looking at um, sites for, for business and industry. And when we were promoting the fact that our town centres are in a changing role and they can't be seen just as retail anymore, that again was, was quite a surprise to them. And then when we were talking about, you know, reducing... <laughs> Thank you, it's trying to get me shot. <laughs> Yeah, about, you know, reducing the number of cars in an area. So we're creating town centres that people want to spend time in because that has to be a new future for them. And um, that, again, was an opening up for them to realise that there's a changing role for town centres away from retail and into them being a heart for a community, heart for local living and so on. And so. <laughs> okay, I think we should go for a break. And we're going to have the next session on housing. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes. If you can just quickly do what you want to do in the break uh, and get back very quickly. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> yes.